The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of the streaming platforms, public access channels, the Kitty Rose lifestyle, or the program underwriters. Tim's on my feet, stomping out the negativity. Everybody not a friend of me. Spread the love, still I move deliberately. Bully face on, but the smile be heavenly. Brooklyn girls, so they love the energy. Love sincerity, so I take the liberty to take them on a journey lyrically. Through hallways and alleys. Dark yeah! 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 The next episode, or this week's episode of The Next Chapter. I'm a little nervous because this is my first show that's kind of by myself, but not by myself. So welcome, welcome, welcome to The Next Chapter, where we discuss shades of gray. And today, I would like to welcome our first guest co-host. Drum roll, please. I'll do my own. <laughs> Miss, I'm going to say her, her government name is, I didn't even know this, Keisha or Hudson. I hope she's okay with that. But we all well, know her. I mean, you can't take it back now, but I wasn't. <laughs> I'm not. But it's out there now. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was, it, it was public domain. <laughs> Welcome, Kiki or everybody. Woo, woo, woo. From Just Bloom, for all those that don't know, you better know. Miss Kiki, how are you, beautiful? I am better now that I am here with you. Thank you so much. I am so excited. And that intro was dope. I love the, the music and the segue and everything. You gotta go. That's, yes. That's what's up. That's what's up. Shout out to Brooklyn's own Sincerity. That's who does our intro, Brooklyn's Finest. And her name, that song is New York Shit. So, ah! I'm glad you like it. So let's get right into it. No need for anything. Let's let's do it today. This week's topic of the week. You ready, Kiki? I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. ready. Okay. This week, and I think this is a topic. I don't know if Melissa would have been able to rock with this topic, but me and Kiki, I, we got a <laughs> shitload to say. This week's topic is a strong black woman. Mm, put your cape on. Put your cape on. Put your cape on. <laughs> Or maybe take your cape off, take your cape off, take your cape off. Both. How about that? <laughs> I was on the phone with one of my girlfriends the other day, and she said, I'm tired of people saying the strong black woman. I'm not strong. I just didn't have an option. Mm. What do you think about that statement? Well, I, I mean, that's, that's her. I, I think that that's probably most accurate, right? That we often feel that we don't have a choice. And based upon bringing the experience that it can feel like we have no other choice but to be strong so um i get it in fact the other day um not the other day but most recently i was talking to this gentleman and like we were texting and i told him like i was like i lost my job and then he says to me his t response back to me wait for it was oh you are you know you're so smart and you're strong you'll be okay that pissed me <laughs> off I'm like, we're not going to strong woman me right now. <laughs> right. Because what does that have to do with the current circumstance? What does that have to do? Does that now mean that I'm not in need? That that doesn't mean that I don't get to be supported? Does that not mean that I don't have to get, I get an ear to listen to? Like, what does that mean? So, yeah, the strong woman syndrome is a big thing that we are, uh, many of us can identify with and are combating now. So, yeah. When I, when I Googled up, Google's definition of the strong black woman so that I can have some meat or some research to kind of discuss this topic off. It said that the strong black woman has been standing tall for many decades. She's unbreakable, resilient, almost, what you said with the, put the cape on, superhuman. She's selfless, strength personified, the type of woman that can stand all kinds of tribulations and come out even stronger. The human embodiment of the maxim that what, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But, however, so what's the problem with this seemingly empowering depiction, depiction excuse me, of black women? 
Prior to the strong black women's throat, there were negative stereotypes of black women. The mammy, a nurturing, friendly, always smiling black woman, generally a slave or servant who functioned solely to serve the needs of their white families. The Jezebel, who, which portrays black women as sexually insatiable and animalistic in their desires, and the Sapphire, also known as the angry black woman, depicting black women as irrational quick-tempered, and impossible to work with. I've heard that before. The strong black woman was initially conceived by black women to subvert these negative stereotypes. But in its popularity due to television and film, it's created a stereotype that's just as dangerous as those it intended to replace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's I, I like I mean that's that's a that's a big definition like that's a huge term. <laughs> big right it's a lot in that cap but also it's almost as if the pendulum has swung from one extreme to the other and that's okay because I think that that's what we do right we go from one extreme to another until we can somehow get to some middle ground right some level of balance. And I think that that's what's occurring now. Like we got all the way to the other part where we're like, we're strong and we can do it. And I don't need you and I don't need this help because, and not that I don't want it sometimes, like, but I feel like I don't need it Mm -hmm. um, because I don't trust that you will come through for me because I've been disappointed so Mm -hmm. many times over and over and over again. So, you know, if it is to be, it is up to me kind of mentality. And I know I can count on myself all of that, Mm -hmm. um, I think, is what we contend with. And as the time has now gone on, I think we're starting to, the pendulum is starting to come somewhere in the middle where we're starting to get that we get to be supported, that strong is a choice, right? That there are people that we can trust and rely on, um, that vulnerability is okay to ask for support and to ask for help. And um, and we get to relinquish that strong woman kind of person- personification, if you will. So, because I know for the longest time, we're always hearing when someone describes their mother growing up. I'm sure you can say this. I don't have the best relationship with my mother, but I definitely remember growing up saying, I always remember my mother working. I always remember her working. I always remember her working. And I think at some point that was kind of glorified that she's oh, she got it holding down. You know, she keeps it everything. You know, she, she's going to make sure financially the family is always taken care of, even if she goes without. But how healthy is that? You know what I'm saying? How healthy was that for her? You know, um, did that cause a level of resentment? You, you, you don't know what these, uh, these syndromes end up being placed upon us that we take on and then repeat subconsciously, not even realizing that now we're teaching our daughters this. Don't rely on nobody. Don't depend on nobody. Get it done. You know what I'm saying? You could do it. And not that she can't. But I think, again, what help, what, what, what's the problem is that now we don't ask for help. We are, but we weren't, you know what I'm saying? And we did take on everything which was our own demise and our self-care, you know? Yeah. Um, the first video that I was able to uh, get was the negative effects of the black woman, of the strong black woman stereotype. Let's check out what this video had to say and then come back and discuss it evaluation into what did I believe about my womanhood. I didn't want her to associate her life as a black woman with your ability to endure and withstand a great deal of pain and still be able to say, well, I'm strong enough to get through that. Both Keys and Gascombe say the first step to ensuring the health of black women is reminding them to take care of themselves. They believe philanthropy starts with self. At some point, you know, you're going to have to learn how to save yourself. And and that is that radical self-love and that radical self-care. And we were just saying that self-care, you know, we're the last ones on the totem pole. We're ready to take care of everybody else, but we tend to not take care of ourselves. But now, like you were saying, the revamp, I do think, is coming from now this more self-awareness that, wait, we can't take care of everyone else without first taking care of ourselves. So I do agree with the video that we have to start kind of looking at, you know, what does self-care look like first? And then maybe the self-care of ourselves will allow others not to put so much pressure on ourselves that we put on ourselves you know mm-hmm. like we what's that saying treat teach people how to treat you that's right you know yeah. so so i wanted to ask 
<laughs> it's so funny because I told Kiki, like, yeah, you better get, you're not going to have the same problem, but listen, hey, you better jump in, mama. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because we used, because we used to going back and forth with each other, you know, as black women. You know what I'm saying? I was trying to be sexy, but I think I might be showing too much. All right, give me a second. All right, cool. So I wanted to ask you, like, you were raised by a woman. What? Duh, you were raised by a woman. You were raised by your mother. Um, and then you're raising three girls from three different or at least two different vast age groups. How has the stereotype been, like, were you raised in a household where that was the imagery that you saw and then you carried on as a mom to three girls? Or did you, you know, change the way you was, like, what was your experience? So, you know, it's interesting. I had such a vast kind of experience and upbringing. I lived in several different households. I lived with an aunt and uncle. And I say that because I think that there is a myth often that like black people grow up in like uh, non-traditional homes, like non-two family homes. Yeah. I lived with an aunt and uncle for a little bit, but even living with an aunt and uncle, aunt and first of all, I don't even know why I'm saying aunt because I've never said that a day in my life, an aunt and uncle, um, and but there was a two family household and my mom was a single mom. And then ultimately I was raised by my grandmother and my grandmother um, was with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was, I've experienced two family households mm -hmm. um, in that sense. But um, my grandmother worked okay. and she worked really hard, but my grandfather was a provider and he okay. was there. But I also saw my mother who had some challenges in her life, which is the reason why I live with them, but had some challenges in her life and how she's overcome. And the overcoming was also because there was a lot of pain that she mm. had to endure, right? And I think I internalized that. I internalized that as about, we gotta overcome, mm. we get through, what is it you need to do? And not really being able to have lots, seemingly have lots of um, support, but it's not true, right? Because my grandmother took care of me, which meant that my grand my mother was supported. Okay. Right? <laughs> care of me, right, which means my right, mother was okay, supporting. Right. Right? I think it's all about how we see it and mm. how the story that we tell ourselves. Um, but in the story that I was telling myself growing up, but I didn't see that until now. This is hindsight being 22. <laughs> this is me looking back. Then I was like, oh, I got to do this. Right. So with my daughters, okay. 31, 28, and 16, as you said, that's different. <laughs> no, 17. She actually just turned 17. Right. Shout just out, Nala Star. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so there was, um, I think my daughters would probably say, and you have to ask them, but they would probably say because they saw me raising them primarily as a single parent until I was married to Nala Star's dad, but primarily as a single parent. So they saw me grinding working hard, doing all this stuff, pushing babies on shopping carts, one on the hip, cooking, like all of those things that we seem to be stereotypical of a single mom, um, making do with very little, all of that. And I think as I grew, I learned and evolved the importance of being able to put the oxygen mask on myself. But mm. I'm going to tell you when that happened, that didn't happen well until I was 40 years old. Tell that. <laughs> Tell that. And I think that happened for me, not in the beginning of my 40s, but like the, towards the end of my 30s. And I really actually, ironically, I don't, I'm not supporting or advocating this, but it also started when I started smoking. Because when I started smoking, I would actually take out that time for myself. I used to call it mommy's 15 minutes. So I would come mm. home and I would, and that would be the only time that I closed my door. I never, you know, I don't believe in the, the door closed policy in the house. So my door was always pretty much open. But when the door was closed, mommy was taking her 15 minutes. And that was the only time that I could remember um, as a parent, you know, taking my own time and saying, unless the house is on fire or something is deadly wrong, do not bother me during these, these, these 15 minutes. And I really took to the 15 minutes. And then once my 15 minutes was over, I'm now, I'm, I'm with you. You know what I'm saying? I'm in full flow, full flow, able to be on mommy mode to do the, the cooking and the homework and, you know, the picking up and everything that was involved, especially during the time that, you know, I became separated because my children love to remind me that um, I wasn't a single parent, that I was a divorced parent, you know, mm. and, and that really was the case. So I never had to, you know, do that struggle of I'm by myself taking care of my kids. But I think that 
because we tend to do that, put on, on ourselves. You know, that's another detriment probably that also affected my marriage because I, I was trying to boss him, you know what I'm saying? And not consciously, you know what I'm saying? But overall, like, you're the head of the household, but I'm acting like the head of the household because I'm the one who runs everything. And technically, yes, but like you said in the, the balance with your grandparents, yes, your grandmother worked hard, but you saw that she still had a compliment. She still had a partner, which goes back to the original uh, man, you know what I'm saying? He was perfect. You know, supposedly that's what we told, but yet the creator still found that he needed a compliment. You know what I'm saying? That he needed that, you know, that additional, and he gave him Eve. You know what I'm saying? So we are not supposed to carry everything by ourselves. But I think also in that story of Eve, and because she is now the the one who has the birthing pain, <laughs> with the birthing pain came like this this weight almost that came with life pain that we took on or that was brought on to us because now we're the nurturers where the men are like, what's that caveman? They, they hunt and go get the food. <laughs> and we, yeah. we home cooking it up. <laughs> you know, you said something that was, you said something that I caught, and hopefully I can run it back. But there was something that you inferred, right? Like you were a divorced parent and in that you still was telling this kind of this story or this narrative of like, I got to carry it all. I'm doing all. <laughs> and I think that I wonder if in somewhere in that is that we didn't, we as black women holistically, like really don't feel, hadn't felt valued, mm. right? And worthy. And so that was how we got our worth, right? Even in situations where it wasn't even accurate, you know, because you get kind of accolades for, for being told like I'm the single mom and I'm doing that and you get the you know the big ups and yeah girl and you be know how to do this and you know feels like you get encouraged but if not like it's like where was my value where is my worth if that wasn't the story that I was sharing if that wasn't the story that I was living I just when you said it I was like wow it's interesting that you know and and not to, to, to say that that's not the case for many of us but I really realized that my value and my self-worth was not wrapped up in being that strong woman that I needed to access that in another way. Right. Um, so when you said that, I was like, ooh, wow, even with the support, <laughs> even with the support, we're screaming like I'm doing it all by myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in actuality, some of us are not. Right. Um, I mean, I was for a long time. So that, that's, that story still stands. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to I'm it. I'm sticking to it. Let's go to our first PSA. <laughs> Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency. Build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash my plan. You know, a lot of people say, when you're going somewhere, you don't want to look back. But I beg to differ. I can't lie and say it was easy. I looked at everything in a different light. I realized it started with me going back and getting my high school diploma. I uh, love that emergency PSA because have you done the prep in your house? Like, have you guys done like the, you know, what happens in the state of emergency? No. <laughs> so no. that was your reminder. <laughs> that was no. That was, that was, that's funny that you said that because I was listening and it said plan. And I literally wrote down, have a, what's the plan, right? Like, mm -hmm. what's the plan as it relates to what we are talk, what we're talking about, right? What's the plan as it relates to de debunking this strong with it? What is the plan that we have for ourselves and being able to take care of ourselves? Um, and can both things exist, right? Can we, because they can. Right. We could both be strong and we could be soft. We could be strong and we could be vulnerable. We could be strong and we can ask for support. We could be strong and we could be loved. We could be strong, like both, there's space for both to exist. Right, because I think, like you were saying, that we can 
we can have all of these qualities and these attributes. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, there's nothing wrong with the fact that we were trying to even debunk the myth that was being put upon us. I remember growing up and was told, you know, not to wear red nail polish or red lipstick. Like that was the Jezebel. You was the fast girl, you know. And I and I have been told or I have been kind of addressed that you know black women are more fast, you know, or we or we you know we we tend to uh, be more sexual. And then the other myth is that well white women are more perverted than we are you know what I'm saying but again it's like these stereotypes that are put upon us you know and then we take on them you know what I'm saying they're not necessarily fact what I also learned every feeling ain't fat you know what I'm saying so now that you know everyone has these feelings against us even ourselves we've made them fact by now repeating this cycle and teaching it to our children without realizing that no that feeling is not fact. That feeling is just someone's feeling that they projected onto us. So now we're not only debunking the stereotype that the world has put, we're debunking even what we know for ourselves to be true. Like you were saying, yeah. we can come from that two-parent household, we can come from the village and still be like, I did this by myself. You know what I'm saying? Not taking ownership and being okay that we had help. You know, and then outside of motherhood, just that strong black woman syndrome, period, you know, we deal with on the job, you know what I'm saying? Especially if we're in a situation where we're one of, you know, two or three black women and we're surrounded by 10, 15 white women or everyone else, we always got to feel like we got to prove and make sure that we stand out, that we the best, that we do our work 10 times better than everybody else. We can't afford to be mediocre. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's not in our vocabulary. You know, we always got to be the best of. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But why is it that we can't just be the best of? Why is it always that stigma that, well, you know, you can't let the race look bad? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, let me tell you so, so a couple of things. One is, yes, and I amen that. And I remember when my daughters were in private school, right? They went to private school when they were younger, predominantly a PWI. And, um, and they, got, they were on scholarship or financial aid. I told them off the rip. Right? I was like, I'm just gonna be very clear with you all. You may be there, you may be having, you know, financial aid or scholarship, call it what you wanna call it, but you are there because of the smart and intelligent mm. young ladies that you are. And don't let nobody try to tell you anything other than that. Okay. Like I started to debunk that very early okay. on because I know that sometimes you could be seen as, you know, like other. And then people are like, oh, you're there on this, you're there on that. I'm like, you're mm. there because you're smart. And trust and believe, and this goes for work too, trust and believe. If you were not value add and you couldn't add to their bottom line, or you couldn't have the school look good at the end, right, right, or wasn't right. going to a good college, you wouldn't be there, darling. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't be there. So this is a this is a, a, an exchange, right, of sorts. And so even at work, this experience of, um, I remember my Baba used to say to me when I used to go for job interviews because I did carry that. I mm. need to show up as the best. I need to do this. And it would come as a lot of talking. Da, 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 da. I, my resume used to have so much on it because I wanted you to see all <laughs> that I did. Oh, I was so fully loaded, right? Like, I got to tell you the story so that you could, like, choose me. Mm -hmm. And he used to just say to me, "Wow, you have nothing to prove. Wow. You, and, so at the, and so every interview, you know what I would write at the top of my resume? What? Be of service. <laughs> Be of service. That's what I was there to do. Mm. And that's innate in me. That's mm. natural. I don't have to prove any of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that that's where I started to get grounded and rooted and that I have nothing to prove that I, that I know what I know. I am who I am. I'm always learning and growing, but I'm not going to be out here shucking and jiving <laughs> so that you, so that so you bad. can feel comfortable, right. so mm -hmm. that you can be okay with my president, I'm also not going to silence myself right. so that you could be comfortable, right. so that you could be okay right. in my, you know, with my present. I'm going to, I'm here to take up space. Mm. Have you been called a bitch or that you are 
uh, over dramatic or emotional because you're a woman or because you're a black woman? Like, what has men's response been? Because you know, we always hear that other side. I don't date black women because they are they too you know they too feisty. You know what I'm saying? In other words, for we don't shut the fuck up. You know what I'm saying? Like, know your place, know your role. You gotta know your role. That's why you single. That's the baby. That's why. Oh, that's why you single. I had a guy tell me one time I met this gentleman and he was like, oh, so why are you single? And I was like, because I because I said I could ask you the same question. Why are you single? He was like, well, because I don't want to date anyone right now. And I said, well, well, that's the reason why I'm okay. right. But that but the impl what he was implying, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> on how I showed up or how I answered, he was like, oh, you're something else. Right. So there's a little air of what they would consider sass. Right, but I consider confidence. If there's any that, then that's why you're single. No, sir, you just don't have what it possessed to be in the presence of a woman that is confident, that is sure of herself. I, while I may be independent, I also know how to be to work and be interdependent. Right. I have the ability to do that, right? But I was there's a guy that I'm dating. And he said, a lot of times women don't do that. It's not because they don't want to, it's because they haven't found a partner in which they can trust that create a safe space for them to be. So that was what I was getting ready to say. That's another role that comes in into parenting. Because when we're raising our girls, what are we teaching our boys? How are we teaching our boys to now interact when they become young men who are now this new generation of dating? I had to make sure that, you know, what I was teaching my daughter or what example I was setting for my daughter, that I was being mindful about what example I was setting for my sons. So as I started earlier saying that I was starting to become disrespectful to my husband, that was one the reasons why I also ended the marriage because I didn't want my sons to think that that was okay for a woman to speak in such a tone or such mm -hmm. a manner to her partner, you know, because I needed to teach them also what, what it looks like in their manhood to, like you said, support, acknowledge, appreciate, not be intimidated, not, you know, even though my, my middle son don't date black girls and we got an issue about that, you know what I'm saying? But overall, it's about he still knows how to treat young women or treat women and that's where we have to kind of like also start de debunking this myth of the strong back woman not only with our daughters but with our sons so that they also learn how to be compliments and and and, and, and considerate of their partner's strength well how did you so what did you what what did you do what was some of the things that you shift in terms of your sons and being able to them to see a different side of you. Well, I definitely made sure that I let them also see the vulnerable side. And I communicated that as, as much as that it was a, that I was able to do, that I was able to hurt that I was able to ask for help. I'm very uh, vocal, not only with my, transparent with my daughter, but I was transparent with my sons, especially since I had them before her. So they were the, like the, the guide for me to be as great as I was with my daughter because I knew that they were initially my, what was important to me, setting that tone and that example. What I also did was I showed them what it was like to treat, how to treat a woman. I'm very about manners. It might be European or Eastern, but I'm very much walking, you know, outside on the street, you know, open the door, you know what I'm saying? Not that a woman can't open her own door, but show that you're a gentleman. And people say that to me, that, oh my God, your sons are so polite. Your sons are so manner, uh, show mannerism. You know, I made sure that the women that they are with, they all feel protected because I gave them the responsibility of also protecting me, helping me, not just do the chores, but you're assisting in these chores because how about we live in this home together? This ain't just my house. It is, but hello, this is our home that we take care of together. Our second video is Dear Black Women, Let's talk about healing, because even though now we're talking about what's necessary to debunk these stereotypes, now let's see if we can start to give some tools, like you just asked me about my sons, on how we can start uh, taking down this narrative, still be strong, but not have this imagery upon us that we don't need an assistance. Being born a black woman means we are born with the responsibility to live our entire existence in resistance. 
Resistance to the boxes and the lines. Resistance to the black woman can't designs. Resistance that she must excel but then step aside. Resistance to the coughing and then choking on the lies. Resistance to the constant game of seek and hide while the gamers trade her currency, her dignity and pride because she learned this transaction as a child. And what we see is not for us. And that includes the system of injustice and the reality of the responsibility makes the black woman scream and it invades all her thoughts and consumes all her dreams, both at nighttime and the ones she used to have in the sun. Being born a black woman means we are born with a responsibility to live our entire existence in resistance. The responsibility to stand up and ball up a fist and shout this is bullshit until somebody listens and then move like the queen that she is on her mission. Black woman, black woman, you forgot your crown because you had your head lowered down and it fell to the ground. Pick it up and polish it till it's shiny and bright, deflecting that fight and projecting the light of your God-given rights. Resistance. Persistence. Thank God for your existence. <laughs> dear black woman, dear black woman, let's talk about healing. Why? Because when I read the fourth draft of my TEDx talk to my mother, she responded, Angie, you're right. We didn't know we could cry or heal or any of that. Therapy wasn't something that black women even considered because we were always so, well, you know, strong. Girl. Mm. <laughs> Girl. Amen for resistance. However... <laughs> I have started therapy, and girl, I, for someone who thinks they know it all and was confident, I'm learning so much about myself. I also know that you... I do therapy. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for therapy. I'd be like, oh, oh you, you, maybe you should go and talk to somebody. Oh, well, I'm, I'm about that therapy life. <laughs> and Always I, have. What I like about the therapy life is that what happens with the resistance and the mission is that we get tunnel vision. And then we don't think about anything else because it's got to get this done, got to get this done, got to get this done. And I realize that that even affects our relationships, how we deal with people outside of the household. Because the, the household is the main priority of everything, of all of our existence, you know? So we forget that it, it, it interferes with how we communicate or how we ask for things when people outside of the house um, want to be in our lives, i.e. a man who might be dating you, who feels like you're not being sensitive to him because you almost feel like, well, you should be happy that you're dating me because I got it so together. But then in that I got it so together and he should be grateful to be dating me, we take for granted that he also needs attention, that he also needs to be acknowledged that, you know, I'm thinking about you or that, you know, when I was out, I bought you a pack of underwear. You know, not everything has to be so big. And I think in our tunnel vision, we forget about him or them. You know what I'm saying? Because we focus on the house and the kids. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and that could also be to our demise. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you said, you said a mouthful. You said a lot. Um, and I'm going to go back to, first of all, therapy, I think, has been um, a life changer for me because it is breaking those generational um, cycles um, and the trauma and allowing for the healing. And like you said, for me, too, I'm learning so much about myself, right? And also learning to, like, give myself grace and not to be upset about the things that I have done or the things that I didn't do because, like, I, I wasn't aware of you. you you, if you don't know, then you don't, you don't know, right? You can't change it. But also, you know, I was talking to my therapist and I was saying to her that I was doing this show and I told her what the topic was. And she said, oh, that is 
perfect. She was like, because you are in your you are in your season of like debunking this strong woman. That is the season that I am and I'm in the season of receiving. Amen. I am the season of I'm in the season of yes. I'm in the season of season of being able to receive and say thank you to the gentlemen or gentlemen that may come into my my presence, yeah. right? And also being able to see hear and acknowledge him. Because mm. I think that that is really, really key. It's not just a relationship or it's a partnership, right, right? right? I have feelings. He has feelings. I have needs. He has needs. Now, maybe men are not as verbal or vocal about them, but doesn't mean that they do not exist. Right. But if he is not as verbal or vocal about it, but I have the wherewithal and I am, exactly. do I not have a responsibility? Because exactly. I am aware. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I am aware. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. I am I am in this season of like, and matter of fact, I'm gonna show you this real quick. So when I was um right before the show, before the show, I was like, um, I'm about to do this show and I got a call and was like, come downstairs. I was like, but I'm about I got like, he was like just five minutes, five minutes, honey. And I can't I was like, no problem. And I got me a bouquet of flowours. Why? <gasps> right? Part of the reason I just beautiful flowers, right? <laughs> What well, part of the reason is because I went the way I've, I've been showing up and this newness mm. has been about sharing myself openly, honestly, and vulnerably, mm. not worrying about what it looks like. I shared off the rip that I I lost my job. And sometimes you want to like hold on to that because mm -hmm. you don't want nobody to think that little, whatever. <laughs> No, I, I shared that. I share all the things that I would share with a good girlfriend. Cause I said, cause that's what relationships are about, right? right. It's a, if I could talk to my good girlfriend, why would I now withhold that from a gentleman that I am looking to be in relationship? So yeah, yeah. it's all about like sharing, honesty, openly vulnerable. Vulnerability is really big for me. And I'm learning that that's where my superpower exists. It's in the vulnerability. Amen. Let's check out another PSA. I tell my son, I love you every single day. I love you. Now, my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says, I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. I chose the father commercial because that's a, a key problem that we have a, as a nation, as a people, is cultural restrictions. You know, these cultural restrictions, again, that we think are just a black thing or a white thing, you know, we see it happens across the board. And I think this syndrome of the black strong woman is something we have because, unfortunately, we're so vocal about not necessarily our strength, but about our struggle, you know, and we're more vocal maybe than other cultures, so it seems that, you know, it's something that hits us more than others, but culturally, I think we all experience these different types of restrictions that we carry on, like these syndromes that we put on ourselves, that we have to always be strong, and that by being weak, that's that sh actually showing strength. By being vulnerable, that's showing strength. By asking for help, that's showing strength. When we try to do everything ourselves, it's actually the weak part of not having the ability to ask for help, you know? Not having the ability to hold our friends accountable rather than sit in our own shit about stuff because they're not helping. They're not, you know, doing more. They know I'm fucked up. Why aren't they doing? But we're not asking for their help so why are we projecting what we want onto us onto them if that makes sense oh it makes perfect sense it makes it makes perfect sense we will stew in some stuff right <laughs> when we feel like our needs are not being met and that's ultimately it our needs are being met needs are not being met because we did not ask mm. We people are not mind readers. They do not know what we need if we do not express what is it that we need. And I have a question for you guys. 
So one of the things that I want to know from you in terms of feelings, how do you express feelings? Because I think that um, in being strong, I've learned this about myself in therapy, that I will tell you a lot of things and I will share a lot. And you'll be like, oh, she's so transparent. She's so vocal. She shares a lot. And in that, if I asked you how I feel, you may put a feeling on it that is actually not accurate based upon how I'm expressing it. And I learned that I actually do not use words that um, exemplify feelings. Like I avoid, you rarely do would you hear me say, I am sad, I am happy. There was historically, I am sad, I'm disappointed. That really hurt me. Mm. I, that, you know, that frustrated me. But really do we hear, and I think that when we start to get more into that, then the healing can really begin because people can, then it's not about the strong, they really get to, to see how what is happening is affecting us in feeling. So how do you express your feelings? Or do you find that you actually express your feelings by using feeling words? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, Okay, I know we're ready for our third video because normally I just do two, but I want to answer this question. Um, I'm learning to be more expressive um, because I have been held hostage to someone's feelings and I have held someone's hostage and I have held someone hostage to my feelings. So what I'm learning to do or what I've learned to do over the years, like with my children, is be um, more direct and intentional when asked the question and when giving the answer. So if I'm asked the question, well, how you're doing? If I'm not doing good, I'll say today's an okay day or today I'm not really feeling at my most or I'm okay, but at the moment I'm not, I, I don't feel well. And what that has done is allowed the other person not just to give me a superficial answer reply back now I've made them accountable to do the check-in and it's made me more accountable to listen when those are now talking to me using those words so because I think it's a, a tennis match it's a both you know people don't talk if they don't feel like you're gonna listen so if I'm not listen if I'm not talking to again showing them how I want to be treated I'm also showing them how they could be, be treated in the relationship if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah it does. The last video, which I like I said, I normally just do two, but I wanted to give a wrap up of do black women always need to be strong? And that just really just ties into what we were saying of how we act and how we show up for help if we don't verbalize the words directly. You know, how do we still communicate with loved ones that we um, might need some help or that we're just not OK today? I'm so tired of being strong all the time. Yeah. And it's when people tell me, you don't have to be strong. And I'm like, OK, but when I'm not, look at what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, things fall apart. I think you speak a lot to, like, the role of black women, like, that we're allowed to play, right? Like, the helper, the fixer, the saver, the strong one. And, like, it, it, it does take a toll. So I resonated with, like, a lot of what you just said because I feel like for a while I positioned myself as the mm -hmm. fixer, right? And then, like, through therapy, she was like, Shadi, you don't need to do that because guess what? Didn't nobody ask for that? And I was mm -hmm. like, what? <laughs> what you mean? But they need me. <laughs> no, they don't. They'll be yeah. quite all right. I'm like... <laughs> What are you talking about, right? And this was recently and like just shifting from like not always volunteering to help and fix and do all these things and just like she said, she's like, Shade, stay in your lane and mind your business. I'm like, well, why don't you mind your business? But she was right though. <laughs> yeah. And I think that like part of that has also forced me to think about the ways that I've like accepted some of those roles and have been comfortable in those roles um, and also grapple with what parts of vulnerability have been uncomfortable for me. And then attached to that is like, how is vulnerability, how has it been extremely liberating for me as well? So it's just so much to balance because I think like these roles don't allow black women to show up as soft mm -hmm. um, when we wanna be soft. And I think that's part of what vulnerability is about and reclaiming our narrative. And not only are they not allowed to show up soft, we don't give ourselves permission to be soft. Yes, you yes. Know? I, you know, I wrote, I was like, I'm sick and tired. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Girl, 
But if that's really the case, then we have to learn how to, to let go. We have that's to right. learn to receive, you know what I'm saying? We have to learn how to, it's not showing again weakness to ask for help or to take time off, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's not always about asking for help. Sometimes it's about taking on our own help, our own self-care and saying, pause, stop. Let me have a moment for myself because guess what? I am human. But I love the fact about not always volunteering. I think that's another problem <laughs> that we have. I know that years ago, my brother recently taught, well, recently being years ago, my brother taught me, he was like, Sha, I don't always want you to have something to say. Sometimes I just need you to listen. Whoop. I, I, whoop, what? What you mean? <laughs> I'm, I'm the big sister. I got the advice. What you mean? Right. No, just listen. We don't, we, sometimes we take on this persona that because we know it, because we've done it, because da, 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 you should. Well, well, think about it. What role did you say? You said big, you're a big sister. <laughs> I'm big sister too, right? Okay. Think about it, right? So that when it goes back to something that I had said earlier, which is about value, which is about worth. How, so it's, it's not like all black and white, right? There's some gray in there as well. It's about, you know, the role that we have and how do people be able to see us? So not only am I big sister, but I'm, I'm old enough sometimes to be like, I'm kind of mother sister as right. well, right? And so we take that on and that becomes our role and we become comfortable in that because right. that's, how, that's where I get my value. If I am not right. giving advice, if I am not helping mm. you with your resume, if I am not doing that, if I'm not doing <laughs> that, then who will I be and what will I do wow. and what's my place and space wow. in your life? Wow. What's my, and then that makes me cry because when my mother died, I had to face that what is my space and place in your life mm. if I'm not doing this, if I'm not doing that, and I didn't feel like I would have a place or a space. Mm. And I just learned that like being me was enough. Mm. Being me is enough. And mm. so I think we just got so comfortable in being strong, but not like because we wanted to, but just because that's just the, we didn't know. Right. I just didn't know, right? right? I just <laughs> didn't know. But now I know I can shift it and I can have a different experience. Mm. One that is rooted in vulnerability, one mm. that is rooted in this being, one that is rooted in like self-care for myself yes. and taking time for myself. And then listening, like your brother said, listening for what you need and having and wait until you ask. Mm. Amen. Or asking, well, do you need anything? Right. Is there anything <laughs> that I can do? Not automatically offering. Jumping because, in, right. Right? Because sometimes I do that and then I could, then you could, historically, did I become resentful? I'd be like, damn, why did I ask? I don't know why, damn, well, I really want to do that. Oh boy, here we go. Here we go, right? <laughs> and like, I one last thing, and then my, I was thinking about my mother. My mother used to say, my mother used to show up for everybody. I used to say, when she passed, I was like, my mother showed up. She was a showing up. She has a showing up spirit. And so I took that on and I realized I was tired. Like sometimes I didn't <laughs> want to talk. I, I wanted to, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. But I felt like I needed to be able to do Please, that, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so like, what would people say about me if I didn't show up? What kind of friend would I be? What kind of mother would I be? Mm. And I'd be like, it's not that I'm not choosing you, it's that I'm choosing me. Check out our last PSA for the evening, folks. I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. So this part of the show, Miss Kiki, is when we have our Jesus moment, saying <laughs> from all the three videos, from everything you and I chit chat, because I did tell you I don't really have a format. We just kind of let the spirit guide us, and hopefully that the spirit not only helps us in our healing, but those that are watching. What's your come together Jesus moment of our topic today? Well, I'm going to give you my Buddhist enlightenment there moment. There you go. Yes, <laughs> let's do um, it. But I think ultimately is uh, trusting yourself, because mm. when you trust yourself it then allows and creates space for you to trust others. Um, and that will that will encompass vulnerability. That mm -hmm. will encompass even getting some support and therapy Inbox. if it needs to be. And yes, it is okay. 
it is okay to take care of you and it's also okay to not feel and experience yourself as being okay too so that's my enlightenment moment that's your buddhist <laughs> moment yes, buddhist yes. Moment. What about you? what about you? what's yours mine is um learning how to relax learning how not to take on everything learning how to um show that to my daughter that as much as it's important for her to be a strong independent woman not necessarily a strong independent black woman that she also needs to take time for herself and if i give her those tools at 19 hopefully as a grown woman she won't take on added pressures just outside of living in this this ungodly golly world that we live in and really just giving her those two i think taking the stigma off of um the black strong woman and just being a strong woman and a good person um and also you know teaching her boyfriend you know by the way i teach her how she needs to be treated by her giving that example to him on how she wants to be treated and him keeping that pattern because he also knock on has a mother that's giving him those those guides so i think my jesus moment is just not applying it just to my own life but making sure that i set the example for miss isha rose you know um, yeah so yes. the another the next segment is our inbox question and i was telling you that um you know this is a little slow mo we don't get as many questions as i, I would like but we got today we actually got a couple and I was going to tell you about the the bucket list one but there was another one that came in right before I came into the studio and I want to ask you about this Kelly from Portland said how do you know a man loves you if he doesn't say the words Ooh. well I think that that I think that that's relatively easy right okay you let know? me hear what, what you got to say love is a verb it is an action word and that's the when we get caught up in the words and sometimes people just throw words away you know we we speak to our friends we like love you love you love you right it doesn't mean that we don't but love is in the action so how is the person showing up how is the person demonstrating what are the actions that he is taking that to me is um indicative of how the person loves but also i'm going to say it's important that you get your needs met too if if hearing the word is important to you okay then you get, she gets to ask and say like, I'd like to be able to hear it because that's what you need and that's what you want. But I'd focus on the action first and foremost. What, what he doing, baby? Like I he like. Really doing I like. like. <laughs> I like you guys. For more, for more information from Miss Kiki, because that was some vibe. That was some solid, valid advice. I like that. Guess what, guys? She has her very own podcast called Just Bloom with Kiki Or. So check. Does it come on weekly, monthly? How does your well, show you know, work? I'm, I am in the process, like you, of revamping. I haven't done it in a while, and so it's going to be, it's coming back again, but you can also catch up old episodes. Jess Bloom is reminding you that whether you're in your first season or your 50th, it's never too late to have the life that you want. So, um, yes, you can still catch it on my website, kikiora.com, um, for some old episodes and new episodes that are coming. And that ties right into our spotlight moment. Cause here is another sister doing a new do-over or a second part or third life or her life. This week's spotlight segment is on drum roll. Miss Mara Hall. Who is Miss Mara Hall? Let's check out her little video. Her little vi let's check out her video. <laughs> Cause ain't nothing little about it. And then come back and talk about why I'm spotlighting her this week. Please, this apples and bananas. You the strange fruit up in here is gonna get your fancy lawyer to come bail you out. Get you back to your cushy life while the rest of us stuck up in here. Trust me, princess. Outside of skin color, you and I ain't nothing alike. Okay, everyone, let's give President Grant some privacy. Thank you all. My radiologist will be in shortly to start your mammogram. Thank you, Major General Owens. Yeah. Do you know her? He says she's no longer with you. Where'd she go? Sir, we're not really supposed to disclose that information. Please. <laughs> Did you see what I just saw? Girl, still wonder could see that. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
messenger of God? Boy, you have an anointing on your tongue and don't even know it. Yeah, looks like you got something for later, too. Uh-huh. Thank you. Is there anything else I can get you, sir? You're coming up to you feeling your belly? It's weird. Yes. Large latte? Yeah. Charlie, leave my customers alone. Oh, don't get on her bad side. She's the big. booty, loving the booty round. Booty down for the booty. I want the booty. Hunting the booty. Chasing the booty. Casing the booty. How's that for big in life? Okay, Miss Marvel. Oh, so we yes, see that yes. she is an actor, an actor. But now, as we speak right now, she is in Houston on her way to New York next week for her very first book signing. Marvel Hall is now an author. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, author baby, actor turned author. And her book is Love Bombing, How to Avoid Narcissists, Scammers, and Unlock the Treasures of Self-Love. And she will be in New York on the Fe February 13th, and she will be having a book signing at my dear friend Zaya Jones Gallery, The Spot for Art, Brooklyn, Stand Up. 52, uh, 57, 572A Myrtle Avenue. They, the information will be in the ending credits. But come and check her out. Meet her in person. Come get a book. Have it, her sign and autograph it. I'm hosting the event. So, you know, I'm going to dig in and find out how she became an actress to an author and, and who was the narcissist in her life. Because, you know, it always comes from home first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we are proud of her because, again, this is what this show is about, celebrating these next chapters because they're always um, – never ending. We're always going through these chapters of our life, rediscovering, re falling in love us, uh, falling in love, falling in love with ourselves, um, hating ourselves, coming back to ourselves. Like everything is just ongoing or never ending. Mm -hmm. Oh, and <laughs> never ending. Life is ebbs and flows. <laughs> exactly. So this is the part of the show as we come to a close that we ask all of you to do the things that I don't like to do, but it's necessary for us to continue to grow, which is like follow and share like follow and share the show like follow and share myself like follow and share miss kiki or by going to her podcast just bloom that you can find on her website but also by joining our facebook group page the next chapter you can join us. You can share your next chapters. You can ask our inbox questions. And you can just get more familiar with us behind the scenes. Because each week we come to you and we discuss shades of gray, but we also have different things that we're going on throughout the week that you can also be blessed with. So please check us out on our Facebook group page. Check out again, like I said, Ms. Kiki O. I thank you so much for joining us. How was it, girl? It was amazing. <laughs> You're phenomenal. And I thank you for the space that you create and the stories that you share and giving space for me to participate and so many that are going to come after me and those who came before me. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. Good, good work. Good work. Thank you for <laughs> popping my cherry. <laughs> I appreciate you. Ooh, I appreciate you. somebody first. Yes. <laughs> And I so appreciate you. And I'm going to tell you before we go why I chose you is because I haven't listened to Just Bloom, but I follow Miss Kiki on IG, also TikTok. And I'm going to tell you guys, you think I'm funny or, or, or I talk too much or share a little too much. Y'all got to go with Miss Kiki because I think the new, the new bow, is that the one you did the gift wrapping for? Okay. Yes. 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 you guys yes. gotta check her out yes. AG find out what I'm talking about on that note for everybody I am your host Minister Cat, aka Kitty Rose and I am joined by the beautiful intellectual strong black woman Kiki Orr <laughs> and we are the next chapter where we discuss shades of gray everyone continue to be safe out there love and light Mwah. bye bye good night until next bye. time
be gentle with myself. Learn to navigate winters with no coat. If you never been cold, you never been broke. Hustle 24 7 just to stay afloat. So New York, uh, like dollar pizza in the cold. What? Shit, that real life break from the heart of the city is as hard as it gets. This that New York shit, that real life grit from the heart of the city is as hard as it gets. This that New York shit, that real life grit from the heart of the city is as hard as it gets. This that New York shit, that real life grit from the heart of the city.